Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is such a treat. I've never seen the temple with that wall opened up before. It's great. Uh, because we have a special performance treat in store for you all tonight, I'm going to do a different format than what we usually do. Um, instead of just talking and talking and talking, I'll just talk and talk, and then <laughs> I'll get Ezra, and Ezra will perform the entire Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. Um, so it's, it's a great evening. And Ezra, like Mendelssohn, uh, exhibited a lot of talent at a very early age. So Mendelssohn was born in Hamburg in 1809, and his father, uh, Abraham Mendelssohn, was a banker and fell afoul of Napoleon uh, when Mendelssohn was two. So he moved the whole family to Berlin. And the whole family was four children, his wife, Leah Mendelssohn, and the four children were um, Paul, uh, Fanny, Felix, and Rebecca. Um, Rebecca sang and Paul played the cello, but it was Fanny and Felix who really got the talent genes. And uh, Fanny was three years older than Felix, but for their entire lives, they were absolutely devoted to one another. Uh, Felix regarded Fanny as his musical inspiration, and every time he had a musical idea when he was young, and he had a lot of them, uh, he would check it out with Fanny. So the two of them had this incredible bond. Uh, the parents were incredibly supportive of these talented children. Uh, throughout their whole childhood, they were exposed not just to the finest music in Berlin, but the literary intelligentsia, the poets, the philosophers, the painters. Mendelssohn, if you look at the little sketches he made when he was a child, was an extraordinarily gifted watercolorist. He could illustrate so that it looked like a, an engraving made by a professional adult. Um, there was a lot of talent in this one little child. And he started to give public piano performances when he was nine, but he was also an excellent violinist, and he played the viola, and he played the organ. But most of all, you're pointing something. Talk louder? Oh, OK. Is this live? OK. Let me just talk louder, and if that works, if you can't hear me now, raise your hand. Well, I'm not talking right now. So good, you passed that test. <laughs> or I did, I don't know. Um, so when we look at the music Mendelssohn wrote as a very young man, it's already fully formed. This is what's extraordinary. Uh, Mendelssohn is the 19th century equivalent of Mozart because there are prodigies and then there are super prodigies. Uh, Mendelssohn, when he was 12, decided that he would write a string symphony. And it was successful, so his parents would have a group of musicians come to the house every other Sunday morning to play Mendelssohn's latest symphonies. This is what I mean by they were very supportive of his talent. <laughs> he wrote 12 of these string symphonies between the time he was 12 and 14 and became so skilled that he decided it was time to publish his first symphony. So the symphony number one is actually his 13th symphony because he sort of had the hang of it by then. <laughs> so uh, when he was 15, this symphony number one in C minor is his first published orchestral work. But Mendelssohn, apparently, uh, during the year that he was 12, wrote actually 50 or 60 works, songs, chamber works, and uh, the family would make sure there was always an opportunity for him to perform these. Sometimes they were forehand piano works that he would perform with his sister Fanny. One of the many illustrious visitors in the Mendelssohn household was Goethe, who was 70 by now, and met Mendelssohn when Mendelssohn was 12. And the two of them formed a close friendship which lasted for the rest of Goethe's life, another 10 or 12 years. So Mendelssohn was constantly exposed to the highest of culture. Interestingly, I think, 
uh, the, the composer that he felt the deepest affinity with, and of course he knew all of the great music that had been composed up to his time, was Johann Sebastian Bach. He loved Mozart, he loved Haydn, he loved Schubert, he loved Handel, but most of all, he loved Bach. It's hard for us to imagine that in the 18s, like 1815, 1820, there were no concerts that included the music of J.S. Bach. He was virtually forgotten. So in Berlin, Mendelssohn is discovering Bach on his own, not because he's hearing it in public concerts. Is this better? Okay. I've never been in such a big room. The best thing, I think, that Mendelssohn absorbed from Bach is counterpoint. Counterpoint is the ability to compose simultaneous melodies that each in their own right have a melodic value, but also make total sense when combined. So even in Mendelssohn's early works, we hear a high level of sophistication in counterpoint. This means that these pieces drew the attention of great musicians of the era who said, this child is a genius, not just very talented, but a true genius. Cherubini, uh, people who we now don't think of as great composers, but in the early 19th century were the height of uh, musical achievement, looked at Mendelssohn and had great hopes for him. So I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit and say that even the greatest composer does not actually have original ideas. They have ideas that are original that are based on ideas that have already been discovered. There's nothing shameful in this, that's just the process of, of musical development. But let me try and show you how an idea that is in fact taken from another musical idea becomes one's own musical idea and not simply a copying. One of Mendelssohn's favorite pieces was Mozart's symphony in G minor, symphony number 40, which you recognize goes like this. Right? So Mendelssohn loves two things about this. He loves the way that it's a simple, tonic, dominant, tonic, but that it builds into something much more than that. He loves that the way the string parts are written, he wrote about this, I'm not making it up. He, he, he said the string parts are written in such a way they could never be uh, replicated on the piano because one pair of strings is going. They're playing in thirds. And so he, without consciously doing this, I think, replicates Mozart's G minor symphony in a related but major key, E flat major, and he stretches out the time frame to double the length. So we'll take this through several steps. First, he's gonna do this. All right, then he's gonna do. Now I'm in the dominant. So far it doesn't sound like a great piece of music, right? This is just the stepwise process that the compositional mind goes through. Then he expands this a little bit. Still doesn't sound like anything terribly special. It could be by Kalkbrenner, right? Something like that. But then he thinks, why should I keep to the even eighth notes? Why not add interest to that melody? Give that face some contours by varying the rhythmic elements. <laughs> 
Okay, so it's suddenly starting to take on a personality. Um, now, Mendelssohn, living in the Romantic period, hears a richer harmonic language than his classical predecessors. So he adds. So this bass of. And pretty soon we get. but he's not finished yet. Why let the second phrase match the first phrase rhythmically? If the first phrase goes why not then instead of da da ti to match it, he goes so gradually Mendelssohn builds his own universe out of that Mozart So what, oh, excuse me, here we go. What he has done is scored something that originally takes the harmonic structure of a, a Mozart symphony, but he's created something that sounds completely different, and he writes it for a string octet. Two first violins, two second violins, two violos, and two <laughs> violas, and two cellos. This is a piece that he writes when he's 16 years old, and he dedicates it to his violin teacher, uh, Edward Reitz, and gives it to him on Reitz's birthday. Uh, and of course, his family has the string octet there to play it for <laughs> Reitz. So Mendelssohn's octet, written at the age of 16, is a fully formed work of genius. If you've never heard this piece, I will give you a forecast of our next Santa Fe Concert Association season and say that it will end with the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields playing that string octet. So on May 11th of 2015, you can hear what Mendelssohn wrote when he was 16 years old. This piece was so extraordinary that it put Mendelssohn already in the forefront of European composers. Everybody was aware of him. Chopin heard of him, and they were born in the same year, by the way, Chopin and Mendelssohn. Chopin was in such reverence of Mendelssohn that he was afraid to even go see him or make contact with him because he thought that Mendelssohn's genius was so extraordinary. Mendelssohn's father, Abraham, said to all of his children, we live in an anti-Semitic culture in Germany right now. We are all going to convert to Christianity and change our family name. So when Mendelssohn was seven, two of the children were older, they became the Mendelssohn Bartholdi family. And Mendelssohn was encouraged to sign his name Felix M. Bartholdi because his father said, as surely as there is no uh, Jewish Confucius, there is no Christian Mendelssohn. So he wanted that name Mendelssohn to disappear. But Felix and Fanny never went along with this plan. Even though they had converted, they kept the name Mendelssohn and they were very proud of it, not least of all because their grandfather, Moses Mendelssohn, was a famous philosopher. The philosophy of Moses Mendelssohn was philosophy of the Enlightenment. And when I say the Enlightenment, I mean that mid-18th century movement where reason could solve everything. This is obviously before the Romantic, with a capital R, movement. Mendelssohn, even though he was one of the greatest and perhaps the first of the great Romantic composers, was the only one who never embraced the emotional ideals of Romanticism. He did not favor Sturm und Drang, uh, 
you know, the, the idea that an artist's life and the artist's work would reflect emotional turmoil and devastation, and the greatest artist would be the one who was suicidal and not only was suicidal, but either went crazy or did kill themselves. That was, that was obviously the archetype of the 19th century romantic artist. And yet Mendelssohn had a life virtually untouched by sorrow, grew up in an environment of incredible culture, learning, support, and love, and throughout his life found himself always uh, the, the star. He was the darling, he was the hero, he was never anything less than celebrated as being on the very top. So he was the antithesis of the romantic artist in many senses. And because of his love of Bach and Mozart, his music always had a clarity that was different from the music of Chopin and Schumann and Brahms and Berlioz. It was not long before, and Liszt, uh, and Wagner. They all knew one another, by the way. Uh, these gentlemen were all on better or worse terms with each other, but they all knew each other. Um, the, the only combination that didn't happen there was um, Mendelssohn and Brahms, because Brahms was 15 when Mendelssohn died. But uh, Chopin did finally get up his courage and met um, Mendelssohn, uh, who adored him and called him Chopinetto. <laughs> and they remained friends for 20 years and, and actually uh, had a tremendous respect for one another. Mendelssohn was a fantastic pianist. He was as great as any other pianist. Um, later in life, he and Liszt were together, and Mendelssohn had stopped concertizing, and Liszt was egged on by his friends to play a Hungarian Rhapsody and then some variations. And, he did it with his typical Liszt romantic flair where he threw his body around and did all the things that we associate with the romantics. And he said to Mendelssohn, what will you play for me? And Mendelssohn said, well, do you promise you won't be angry? And Liszt said, of course. So Mendelssohn sat down and played exactly what he had just heard, note for note, including all of Liszt's physical <laughs> mannerisms. And Liszt had promised not to be angry. But that's the kind of musical mind that Mendelssohn possessed. It's extraordinary to us, it's almost unbelievable, and yet he was there very much um, part of the whole fabric of European music making between 1820 and 1847, and uh, created hundreds of masterpieces. So many that literally there are hundreds that he never even allowed to be published. He didn't feel that everything he wrote was equally good. In fact, uh, the famous Italian symphony was one of the pieces that he thought should be chucked out, and fortunately, um, his wife, Cecile, after his death, disagreed with him, and so we have the Italian symphony. You know what that is, so. And uh, what is it going? So we're glad that Fanny, uh, that uh, Cecile decided this was worth preserving, right? You know, the last movement. Uh, well, there, there are so many pieces of music famous pieces of music that we have by luck. You know, Schubert symphonies were set to pack up meat and it just happened that uh, Arthur Sullivan and George Groves were on vacation in Vienna and found them. Um, the 200 or whatever Bach cantatas we have is only half of the output of cantatas he actually wrote. Um, at the time, people did not believe in preserving music. Mendelssohn was reactionary in that he felt concerts of ancient music should be performed. What did ancient music mean? Things that had been written 50 years ago. <laughs> you know, music by Handel and Bach. So when he was 20 years old, he convinced the Berlin Zing Academy, the Academy of Singing, to mount the St. Matthew Passion of Bach. 
a piece that nobody knew and nobody had heard. So he got a 350 voice choir, he conducted the performance, and of course, ever since that performance, Bach's music re-entered the repertoire. Mendelssohn single-handedly is responsible for bringing Bach back into our consciousness. And he thought it was hysterical. He, he said often, wasn't it a funny thing that one of the greatest Christian artworks was revived by a Jewish boy from Berlin? <laughs> so Mendelssohn, without question, had a love of these classics. And his friend Berlioz said, you like these dead people too much. <laughs> Berlioz and Mendelssohn really were close. And Mendelssohn never went away from a meeting with Berlioz not feeling enlivened. His conversation was wonderful. His ideas were far-reaching. The only thing Mendelssohn did not like was his music, <laughs> which he said made him want to wash himself several times every time he heard it. So while Mendelssohn was extremely gregarious and affable with everybody, he had very little tolerance when music made him uncomfortable. And to make him comfortable, it had to be classically perfect. So we wonder why in, you know, in the 19th century after 1870 and throughout the 20th and 21st century so far, Mendelssohn is not regarded in the same level as uh, Brahms and Schumann and uh, Wagner. And I think the reason is truly that Mendelssohn was taking a different path and because it didn't turn out to be the path of history, his music is like a sidebar, it's like an excursion. It's taking the greatest of classical ideals, using them with early romantic harmony, and creating these marvelous pieces, but the expression, of course, doesn't go as far in the emotional excesses of the romantic composers whom we know. So even though it was Mendelssohn who invented this chord, uh, remember in this octet I played, it went, um, so this chord, 30 years later, Wagner writes that chord, same chord. And people don't only consider it groundbreaking, but they give it a name, the Tristan chord. <laughs> now, of course, Mendelssohn didn't know he was using the Tristan chord, writing his octet when he was 16 years old, but he uses the same chord a half a step higher in a work that he uh, writes a little later, the Midsummer Night's Dream incidental music. And even if people don't know any other Mendelssohn, they know this. So what is that? If Tristan had been written a half a step higher, all right. So Mendelssohn was just as revolutionary in terms of his harmonic forward thinking as anybody else, but he was never interested in making the most exotic feature of his composition the point of the composition. Rather, he was almost too skillful because these things fit very easily inside whatever he writes so that you don't even notice that he's done something very forward thinking. After that Midsummer Night's Dream, he writes a piece that is called Fingal's Cave. His parents, having given him every other Sunday morning an orchestra to play on, <laughs> thought it was time to organize a three-year European tour. You know, good parents. <laughs> from, from age 20 to 22, or almost 23, uh, Mendelssohn methodically went around all of Europe. He went to Paris, he went to Rome, he went to Venice, he went to England, he went to Scotland, and he loved England. The whole Mendelssohn family loved England. They were incredible Anglophiles. They took tea all the time. They spoke fluent English at home, and uh, Mendelssohn was embraced by Britain as one of their own. You know, the greatest British composer in the 18th century was Georg Friedrich Händel, and the greatest British composer in the 19th century was Felix Mendelssohn. 
So that just proves the British have really good taste, I think. He went to England 10 times throughout his life. And this first trip to Scotland included a visit to this deserted island on the west coast of Scotland where Fingal's Cave is located. So he wrote really the first orchestral tone poem. A tone poem being a piece that is not a symphony, not in sonata form, but evocative of moods, which is, of course, a very romantic idea. Oh, capital R, romantic idea. And then it has a second theme that goes. It, are you taking that microphone away? Oh, OK. So when I said that Fingal's Cave has a, are we still OK back there? Yes, uh, Fingal's Cave has a second theme. That is a classical sonata idea, that a movement has two different themes which contrast one another. And of course, we find this throughout Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven. And these two themes alternate and ultimately take on new and deeper meaning because of their contrast to each other. So we find that again and again in Mendelssohn's work whether it's symphonic or sonata or chamber music or oratorio. Mendelssohn wrote a number of oratorios, but the two that survive and are frequently performed are St. Paul and Elijah. Now, Elijah, he wrote for England, but he really wrote it for Jenny Lind. Yeah, Mendelssohn may or may not have had an affair with Jenny Lind, but he certainly thought she was Thank you. And uh, now. <laughs> he certainly thought that Jenny Lind was an extraordinary talent. And when he would go to England to see her, you know who we're talking about. This is the Swedish Nightingale, a famous soprano from the 1840s. And in her heyday, uh, another rock star, you know, a Franz Liszt, somebody that people would travel all over Europe to hear. So he wrote Elijah so that Jenny Lind would have a vehicle in one of his pieces. He succeeded completely, but he did have one singer who was a lot more famous than Jenny Lind. And he met her when she was about 20. And this was Queen Victoria. <laughs> Queen Victoria loved his music. And as soon as they were introduced and they were in the palace, she said, uh, Albert, Albert play. And, and Albert sat down to play and uh, performed a song by Mendelssohn. And Mendelssohn said, your majesty, I have a confession to make. This was actually written by my sister, but because it's so difficult for women to have their music published, I published some of her compositions under my name. And uh, Queen Victoria was delighted and of course met Fanny Mendelssohn in due time as well. But um, Fanny came to England and of course did not have the, the reception that Felix did. But she did when she went to be with Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria championed Mendelssohn's music to the end of his life. And when he would say that he was coming on a tour, she would make sure that there would be choral societies, not just in London, but in Birmingham and Manchester and everywhere else, of hundreds and hundreds of singers, this British tradition of gigantic choruses, who would be ready to sing the St. Paulus oratorio or the Elijah oratorio. Uh, and of course, Mendelssohn wrote pieces about Britain. He loved Scotland so much, he didn't just write that overture of Fingal's Cave, he wrote the Scottish Symphony, which he adored and kept rewriting pretty much to the end of his life. So although it's called the Third Symphony, it's the one that he finished last. Um, like much of Mendelssohn's music, it's in a good mood almost all the time. <laughs> 
that again. So even in Mendelssohn's slow movements, there is a sense that the music is never sad, certainly never tragic, and very noble, uh, very devotional, very spiritual. Mendelssohn was interestingly raised with no religion whatsoever. He was nominally Jewish till he was seven and nominally Christian after he was seven, but in fact, he was uh, devoutly removed from everybody. And um, <laughs> when he did write these, these works like Elijah and St. Paul and uh, some of his psalm settings, I think we have to accept that this was um, writing what was needed rather than writing, for example, the way Bach did, something that was a deep um, religious conviction. I think that it's clear from Mendelssohn's writing that he has a spiritual conviction. He feels a connection to God, but perhaps because he was cut adrift from his own religion and put in another one, he never commits to whose God it is. He is uh, his own thinker, and he, he's communing with God directly in his own way. Now, there is another piece by Mendelssohn that everybody knows, but it's not what you think it is. In 1840, Gutenberg had created movable type in the printing press 400 years before, and the Germans decided they would have a 400-year party for the invention of movable print. So Mendelssohn was commissioned to write a song about Gutenberg, and he did. It was called Gutenberg der Deutsche Mann, Gutenberg, the German man, and it goes like this. Hmm? <laughs> Gutenberg, der deutsche Mann, had no religious affiliation whatsoever. It was about movable type. And at the same time he wrote the Gutenberg song, he wrote his second symphony called the Lobgesang. The Lobgesang, the song of praise, is psalms, and the theme is alles was Odem hat, lobet dem Herrn. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And we hear this in big trombone choirs. <laughs> Alles, was Odem hat, lobet dem Herrn. So this um, symphony is modeled on Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and after three symphonic movements, there's a ten-movement cantata with three soloists, tenor, mezzo, and soprano, and big chorus. So this is another example of Mendelssohn taking a work that he loves and turning it into something completely different, and yet the second symphony, the Lobgesang, has a clear source. So in this, he uses uh, seven note themes very often, why? Um, the German translation of the Bible is mystical in that seven was an important, is an important number, and every time the translators could translate the Bible into German when they could make an important uh, text have seven words exactly, they would do that. Alles, was Odem hat, lobet dem Herrn, seven words. Uh, Am Anfang schuf Gott Himmel und Erde, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. In English, it takes more words to do it. So this was a specific feature of the German translation of the Bible, and Mendelssohn tried to match that with his music. So we have this magnificent 75-minute uh, symphony, the Lobgesang. The Scottish symphony, I mentioned the Italian symphony. There's also uh, the very early symphony he wrote that I told you when he was 15. And the fifth symphony, which was not fifth in composition, is called the Reformation Symphony. I think that it's time to talk a little bit about the violin concerto. Mendelssohn had also written two piano concertos. But the prelude to the violin concerto is twofold. One part of it is that Mendelssohn was born on February 3rd in 1809 in this house in Hamburg, and exactly one year later to the day in the same house, there was born a 
Ferdinand David. Now, Ferdinand David became a great violinist, and in 1835, Mendelssohn went to Leipzig where he founded a conservatory. This conservatory was going to have more conservative musical ideals than the newly emerging romantic school around it. And he brought Robert Schumann and Clara Schumann to be on the faculty. Robert taught composition, Clara taught piano. And he brought Ferdinand David to be on the faculty. At a certain point, 1838, uh, Mendelssohn heard a tune in his head, dun da dee dum bum ba dee da dee 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 dee, and he thought, great violin. But it took him six years to get around to writing this concerto. And David, once the concerto was fairly close to completion, would help him out because uh, he could make suggestions about what was more uh, violinistic, even though Mendelssohn was a very fine violinist, he wasn't a concert violinist like Ferdinand David. So um, this piece took shape around 1844, and it's really one of Mendelssohn's last great compositions. Uh, unfortunately, Mendelssohn did not make it past age 38. Um, he had a cerebral hemorrhage, and um, there, there are people who say it wasn't just that, but his sister, Fanny, died of the same thing six months beforehand. And uh, the two of them had such a close bond that once she was gone, he really uh, was beyond devastated by this loss. So the violin concerto written in his mid-30s is one of the last great pieces that he left us. Now, I mentioned to you that Mendelssohn, of course, was a great prodigy. And I think it's only fitting that we have with us tonight uh, an extraordinarily talented 12-year-old violinist and he is going to perform for you the entire Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. Uh, I'm sorry we don't have an orchestra the way Mendelssohn's parents always did, but I'm going to play the orchestra part on the piano. So, uh, Richard, I, I, somebody's getting, yeah. Um, Ezra has been part of the Santa Fe Concert Association's Epic Artist Program since he was nine years old, and he is not only uh, an extremely accomplished violinist, but also a wonderful composer. So as many of you went to our Christmas Eve concert, uh, December 24th. We opened our program with a piece that Ezra had written for full orchestra and two violin soloists. Um, it's always extraordinary to see so much talent and so much going on inside one young mind, but it's incredibly inspiring. Uh, my wife, Jenna, runs our education program, and one facet of that program is to identify the most talented young performers in Santa Fe and to give them the opportunity to perform and perform and perform. Why? You can learn a lot in lessons, and of course all young musicians take hundreds and hundreds of lessons, but there is no substitute for real public performance. So please, without further ado, a huge welcome to our soloist, Ezra Skolnick. <laughs> 
Thank you.
have nothing to follow that. <laughs> so let's all commune together at the other end of the room. Thank you all so, so much. <laughs>